So thank you for joining this webinar series. We are very much focused on talking about preprints and how they are a catalyst for change, in this case, particularly across Africa. We've already had the first webinar, which was giving you an overview of the current system and what preprints are, very much an introduction to preprints. So I'm not going to cover what preprints are or any of that introductory material again. This session is very much focused on the preprint peer review, uh, infrastructure and the quality of preprints, which is a big question people often ask. In two weeks time, we have another webinar coming up, which is how to post a preprint and choose an appropriate preprint server. And then four weeks time, we have our final in this series where we are gonna sit and talk about the issues that are unique to Africa in particular around preprints and what those mitigations might be in terms of how we can challenge some of these things. Each of these sessions are being delivered by different people. Um, so the first session was delivered by Lamis, who was brilliant. Um, and the next two sessions will be delivered by ASAP Bio Fellows this year. And then I'm taking this particular session for a few reasons. So if you don't know who I am, I am the Associate Director at ASAP Bio. Um, I'm responsible for the Fellows Program, amongst other things. If you do have any questions about anything to do with preprints at all, feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to talk through anything you do have, even if it's not part of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. But as I've said, we're going to focus on preprint peer review and the quality of preprints. But before we do that, I just want to spend a little bit of time, just cover that. I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about change because preprints are a really good mechanism for change in academia. But change is very, very difficult. And this is for a whole bunch of reasons. But in academia, above a lot of other situations where you want to bring about change, survivorship bias is a huge problem. And this is very, very relevant to peer review in particular, but is true of, of everything in academia. So you may be familiar with, with this image here. This is a study that was conducted during World War II. And what they did was they looked at planes that are, were returning from various missions and looking at where the damage was. And the conclusion was, well, that's where we must reinforce those planes to protect them from damage. When in reality, what they were doing there was just they were getting a very big survivorship bias. And really, you want to protect the planes in the places where there aren't damage, because if there's no damage, that means the plane probably hasn't returned. The other thing is that academia is kind of a pyramid and there's about 99% of people don't make it in academia who come through at the beginning and the 1% who succeed kind of really go for the, this notion that if it worked for me it must work for everyone else and this makes change incredibly difficult and when we're talking about peer review this is even more of an issue because and I admit to this as well we've all had papers go through peer review and it has improved the paper but I'm going to talk about why peer review actually is a lot of nonsense it does not work at all in its current form despite the fact that it does improve everyone's paper which might be a bit contradictory at the moment so what are the issues with current practices in peer review we continue to rely on this very deeply flawed system of peer review and and i'm sure you're all familiar with what peer review is you send your manuscript to a journal that editor may or may not decide to send it out for peer review if they do normally two to three reviewers who are supposed to be our peers will look at that paper and suggest improvements. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of peer review, and you might be surprised to learn that's not what peer review has ever meant to be throughout history, but it is very much what peer review now is. And it is a very recent experiment. I can't stress that enough. Peer review in its current form, we've been doing it since sort of the 1950s, really only on a regular basis since the 1970s. So it's very recent and it is an experiment. Peer review is full of bias, whether there's gender, race, prestige, the Matthew effect, we know this is a huge issue. We also know that reviewers do not agree with each other. So when you've got two or three people, they can all disagree with what needs improving in the paper, what is good about it, what is bad about it, whether it should be published or not. And this is just because we're human and peer review is actually not as objective as we would really perhaps like it to be. The thing is that peer review does not detect fraud or protect the literature, and it's not designed to do that. 
but often we take peer-reviewed papers to mean that they're reliable and they're trustworthy. But if we're not detecting fraud, then peer review is actually not doing a very good job of that. Peer review is also very bad at detecting gross defects in a manuscript. And I've linked out to relevant references here so that I'm not just saying things. Peer review is expensive and it's slow. So and it hampers science by being expensive and slow. It is, whether we like it or not, perceived as a stamp of approval and it is over relied upon by everybody, whether that is other scientists or journalists or your average person on the street. Peer reviewed is seen as a stamp of approval and of reliability. And I mean, those bullet points I've already said very much tell you that that's not what peer review is doing. But it goes further than, than just these issues because peer review itself is actually abused by some journals. And we're going to come on to this in a little bit more detail. Peer review is subjected to fraud. Retractions are extremely slow. And perhaps most importantly of all, we only share positive peer reviews. We never see the negative peer reviews. And that is very problematic because it would suggest that everything we publish is good and is positive. And as we all know, that's not true. It's a little, little, little uh, game for you to play here. These are two papers, both published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the, the United States of America. Various uh, opinions on this journal's reputation. But I want to know if anyone, anyone can just spot the difference here in these two papers. Um, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to say out loud what that is. Feel free to drop it in the chat. Not that I can see the chat. Uh, if you can spot the difference. Or maybe if you notice the difference when I point it out. One of these papers was peer-reviewed in the normal way we would think of it. So the authors sent it to this journal and the journal sent it out for peer review. The other paper here was peer-reviewed, but the authors chose the peer reviewers, which is a very important point and I think makes a bit of a mockery of peer review. And the only way you would know the difference is by this little statement here. Contributed by or edited by. That's the only indication you have when you read these papers in this journal how they have been peer reviewed. This was the one where the authors chose their own peer reviewers. And it was a very problematic paper. It was published, it was published. But when it was published, over 40 different scientists who were experts in this field uh, called for this study to be retracted. And it's important to note that authors of the study were not virologists. Um, and it was virologists who were calling for the retraction. And that's not a good thing for science at all, on any level. It also, actually, I should point out, it did get media attention. Um, there was a lot of discussion around this, this system and way of doing things. And so you can't really talk about peer review and the issues with peer review unless you talk about the, the predatory journals. And really, when we talk about predatory journals, and we could do a whole session on this, it's not just predatory journals. We've got very much predatory journals, but we've got these quasi-predatory journals, and then we've got things like PNAS, which I've just shown you. And there are a whole bunch of well-known predatory journals, and these damage author reputations, they damage science reputation with the general public. And then, as I said, we've got these quasi-predatory journals, and these are things like Frontiers, Hindawi, uh, MDPI. Should note, Hindawi is no longer a, a brand, so you may be aware Wiley bought uh, the Hindawi brand, and then they retired that name. A lot of those journals still exist, which is, again, something else that is probably worth commenting on, really. So these are journals where they don't engage in quite the same level of predatory practices, but they do things that are considered predatory. Um, and generally, they have a, a poor reputation within their fields, but importantly, not everything published in these journals is bad. Um, there are some brilliant Frontiers papers. But on the whole, the journal brand is quite damaged, I would say. And then we've got this contributor track. 
which is what that last night was all about for journals like PNAS, where the authors choose their reviewers. And you can imagine that this is a problematic situation for many reasons. One of which is that this is only available to people who are PNA, PNAS members. Most of those members are actually those, those big name scientists. And people might not be willing to criticize those people to the same level as you, you should and we need to do. But those people are also not always the ones who take criticism very well. And during the COVID pandemic, we saw a lot of very public instances of big name, important scientists whose work was questioned and they went on the offensive and they attacked PhD students and anyone who was below them. And that is not a healthy ecosystem for science. The other thing is that this, this track has a 98% acceptance rate. Whereas if you submit like you would for any normal journal, this is only an 18% acceptance rate. And you've got to wonder what is happening to have that level of difference. And there are huge gender and ethnicity biases in this. So there was a study done a while ago, and that was done in 2013, but the top track users were all male. So this is this was the the 2013 study with the power users as they called them, um, and you can see how many contributed papers they 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 submitted to the journal. The thing is that actually there, there are also differences in how quickly these things are reviewed versus the normal track for submission. And again, what we see is those that are submitted by these these members the contributed track where you select your own peer reviewers, the review. Um, rates are a lot quicker. Uh, we've got three different subject fields here and you've seen the biological sciences. It's over 100 days if you submit directly, it's under if you do this uh, contributed track. And so journals themselves are actually damaging peer review with these kind of practices. And I'm stopping here talking about this, but I could have an entire talk where I just talk about the problems with peer review because there are many, and there are many examples. There was a very recent one in Nature where um, a Nature paper was published and the data was not made available to the peer reviewers. And Nature were very happy for the peer reviewers not to have access to the data. And that's not what peer review is meant to, it's, it's not right. But let's talk about the history of peer review because I said at the start that we haven't actually been doing it for very long. And it's only been a, a regular thing in the life sciences since the 1970s. I have done a full session on the history of peer review. It's up on YouTube, on the ASAP Bio YouTube channel, if you do want to go away and watch the full half hour talk on that. Um, it's quite interesting, I think. But I'll give you the highlights here. So when did peer review start? If I say we've only been doing it since the 1970s. A very common misconception that I hear all the time and frustrates me to no end is that peer review has been around for about 350 years and is therefore a very well-established gold standard. It's very well tested. Absolutely not true at all. A very rough version of what we call peer review, but it's not peer review, started around the fifth century BC. And this started in you know ancient Greece, ancient Syria. But this is absolutely not peer review in the sense that we, we use it with journals. Then we've got what I term this historical peer review. And this is what people are talking about when they say it's been around for 350 years. This is the history most people who know it will tell you. And most people will say it started with Henry Oldenburg, who I haven't got an image of him. So Henry Oldenburg was one of the editors for the first royal um, proceedings journal from the Royal Society in the UK. And people credit him with starting the process of peer review. But actually, he didn't. Um, he just used his editorial opinion to decide what should or should not be published in the in the journal. And then we had the Medical Essays and Observations, which was another journal, and that was uh, based in Edinburgh in Scotland. They also had some kind of peer review thing going on, but it's not peer review. And then William Wewell, a little bit later, again, with the Royal Society and the Proceedings Journal. Um, interestingly, I, I include William in here because he made a statement that peer review would actually be more interesting than the papers themselves and that peer review would work as almost a, an advertisement for the paper. 
which I, I see is interesting because I think that's what eLife are kind of now doing. We've come full circle here and eLife prioritized the peer review almost as an advertisement for the, the paper. It's quite interesting that we come back around in that way. Modern peer review, and this is peer review that we actually know it. This is you send your paper out to inde peers, independent referees, who review it and send and send those reviews back. That did not start happening on a regular basis until the 1970s. Um, and there's some very famous examples of people like Einstein, who did, was not happy that his work off went out for peer review. The DNA double helix structure, that paper by Watson and Crick, was not peer reviewed. Um, they actually sent that paper to Nature because at the time, Nature, they thought, would put their work out quicker than any other journal. And they did, as it happens. And then in 2017, 2016, 2017, we have preprint peer review starting. Although arguably, and this is a very life science focused view, arguably preprint peer review has been happening for a lot longer than that. So how did modern peer review start? So said Henry Oldenburg is often credited with, with starting peer review, but he just used his own judgment. Um, there was no external opinion. There was no referee system at all. In the 1730s, a little bit later, we had the this journal up in Edinburgh. And this takes what happened was memoirs were sent out and, and they were distributed according to subject matter to people who were versed in those matters. Basically, they sent papers out to people who would be interested in reading those papers. There was no peer review. And then in 1831, as I mentioned, William Wewell took over the uh, editorial of the Proceedings Journal with the Royal Society. And he thought that reports written by teams of eminent scholars might be more interesting than the memoirs themselves. And memoirs here, they're referring to the, the paper and thus a great source of publicity for science, which is very much what, as I said, eLife are now doing. Modern peer review, however, really did get off to a rocky start. And this is why I think it's really important to understand the history because as I said earlier on, this is an experiment and experiments tell you information and you adapt depending on that information and the evidence, or you should if you're a scientist. So Einstein famously had one of his uh, papers sent out for peer review, and he was very, very unhappy with this. And so he pulled that article from the journal and published that, journal, that, that paper elsewhere. Um, ironically, I believe that particular article that he's referring to in this quote did need a bit of work and a bit of improvement, um, so would have benefited from someone looking at it. Um, Watson and Crick, like I said, they, they sent their DNA double helix structure paper to Nature because, and this is a quote, Nature was a place for rapid publication. And it, like I said it was quick. It took a week after the first insight for the first drafts of that Nature paper to start being handed out to people. So it really was quick. And then Max Perutz here, who is a, uh, a Nobel Prize winning biologist, he said that as all papers are sent that are sent to nature are already checked by members of the board, peer review is completely unnecessary. And so, you know, we like to pretend that peer review has been very well established and we've been doing it for a long time, but it's not. And very eminent people have had a lot of problems with just the idea of peer review, never mind actually doing it. And we have been doing it for a long time now. And as I presented earlier in the, the slide with all those bullet points on, there's now an abundance of evidence that peer review has a lot of problems to go along with it. The other thing is we can't talk about peer review without actually talking about USA politics, which might be slightly surprising. The reason peer review started to be widespread adopted in the 1970s is because of something that happened in the US and the, the political structures that was going on. So what happened was there were three uh, congressmen and basically they wanted to have greater oversight over the National Science Foundation funding because they thought the NSF was giving out grants in a frivolous and wasteful manner. Uh, and that was the words they, they used to describe this. And so this set those three congressmen up for a battle with the National Science Foundation. And you can read all the documentation around this. It is available online. But basically what happened was there was a big hearing in Congress and the NSF called a lot of people in 
to effectively defend peer review. And the reason they want a peer review is because peer review would be done by the scientists and it would prevent this congressional oversight. And ultimately what happened was the NSF won. So we ended up with a system of peer review in order to avoid congressional oversight, not because peer review is good or does improve papers in any way necessarily, just because we don't want that congressional oversight. And it was to keep it in the hands of scientists, basically. Now, this was not really about journal publication. This was about grants, but that very quickly filtered down to journal publications. So what's the purpose of peer review if we've got this historical context? Originally, it was to promote scientific outputs and to aid with editorial decisions. It mutated into sort of what we kind of have now, which is about improving a paper and trying to me measure impact and what good science is. Now, nobody can measure impact or good science at the point of submission or publication. It, that's something that takes time to happen. As for improving a paper, I'm sure we'll all agree it is nice when the work is improved, but I'm gonna show you some data that suggests that's not happening as much as you would think. And also we really need to question the worth of that. And by that, I mean the time, the money, and the the cost that is involved in that in terms of careers. Because there are some careers where peer review is taking so long, that person can't now get a job because they haven't got a paper out. Really what peer review should be is, are the conclusions supported by the data and citations within the paper? It should be about working back some of the claims the authors make, because I'm we all get overexcited when we publish our work and we, we tend to make bolder claims than are necessarily supported. And that's where it is good to, to walk those back and be a little bit more conservative with what we say. But it shouldn't be about improving a paper. If you're submitting your work to a journal, I would suggest you're, you're already pretty confident in your work. So if you think it needs improving at that point, you probably shouldn't be submitting it. So what does the current landscape of preprint peer review look like? And this is very much the life sciences. I'm not covering other, other fields here. Well, this is a growing activity. I said it didn't start until 2016, 2017, and it was a very low number. We are now uh, up and it's a much more healthy system now. Roughly about 2% of all preprints are peer reviewed at the moment. Um, and that's journal independent peer review not so that's anything that's not part of the journal process and this is increasing every year it's growing so it is a really good time to get involved with this now if you wanted to because uh, there's still a lot of space to grow and develop this 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 area interesting though preprint review activity differs greatly across fields so what i've done here is i've taken that data from the last slide and i've placed it or i've linked it up to all of the data from bioarchive so this is just one preprint server so the numbers the total numbers will differ a little bit. And what you can see very clearly here is that neuroscience are very much leading the way for their reviewing activity. You might wonder why. Um, but if you were to map this data to the numbers of preprints per category on BioArchive, it kind of matches up. Um, so neuroscience is the leading category for the number of preprints anyway. So it looks like a field that adopts preprints quickly will also adopt preprint peer review quite quickly. It also differs across platforms. I've already mentioned eLife quite a lot in this talk, but at the moment eLife for the life sciences are doing a huge amount of the peer review activity. You could argue if they're a journal or not that they wouldn't see themselves as that anymore. They see themselves as a preprint review service. They do offer the opportunity to then have a version of record published. So they're kind of doing the, the reviewing and the curation steps together. Some of these, so Screen IT is an automated tool. Um, review Commons is a, an independent pre-review uh, service. We've got Pre-Review, which is a very much a community-led peer review service. Some of you may have come across the, the training that they do. We've got Arcadia Science on the far left here, who are, have got incredible numbers. They are a bioscience company in the US, led by Pratchy, who used to be Asa Bio's uh, president of our board. They've got a huge focus on open science. And so that's that's why they're doing so many preprint peer reviews here. The other thing that's growing is recognition for preprint peer review. So 
In France, we've got 29 doctoral schools now who state that preprints recommended by one of their preprint review services would be considered the same value as articles that are published in good quality journals. If you review with pre-review, they've all they've now got uh, integration with ORCID, so you can get an ORCID recognition for that reviewing activity. Preprint servers themselves, so things like BioArchive, have these things very prominently displayed with each preprint, which helps to add the recognition in the activity of reviewing. This could be comments, actual preprint reviews, reviewing on Twitter, never underestimate actual social media type reviewing. And then indexes such as Europe PMC here, place the reviews and evaluations right next to the preprints themselves and any published article from that as well, linking all of it together. We're also getting more formal recognition, and this is in the form of policy changes. So two years ago now, EMBO, which is a big European funding body, they announced that reviewed preprints would fulfill the peer-reviewed publication criteria for people applying for their postdoctoral fellowship program. So instead of having a paper, now you can just have a reviewed preprint, which is a much quicker process than having a, a peer-reviewed paper in, in print. Plan S, which are much more of an independent body, um, they said that papers subjected to a journal independent standard review process, so this is peer-reviewed preprints, are considered to be of the equivalent merit and status as a peer-reviewed publication in a journal. And then more recently, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, from January next year will be adopting a brand new policy whereby they require all the people they fund to post preprints and they, they encourage preprint peer review. I think this is a really good separation. I don't think we should be mandating reviewed preprints. I think mandating preprints and encouraging the review is a really good way forward. Interestingly here though, the Gates Foundation went further and also discontinue to pay article processing charges and publishing fees. So how do you choose a platform to post a review? The thing about peer print reviewing is that it really opens up what a peer review is and where you can do it and how you can do it. And you've got a lot of choice. We described some key features of these platforms and these kind of reviews. You can read that if you want to read that. We also have a, a, a guide basically on how to to choose a, a good place to post your review. So this is a poster you can go away and it's on Zenodo. You can download these. So you can leave a comment, for example, directly on the preprint platform. If you're writing a more traditional review, then preview is a great place to do that. Or you can upload those to Zenodo. You can review with this tool called Hypothesis, which basically lets you write inline comments directly onto the preprint. And they're public, so everyone can see them. Or you can also review as part of your journal club. Every department I've ever worked in has a journal club and it's kind of wasted because you sit and talk about a published paper and you don't share that conversation with anybody. So it doesn't go anywhere. Whereas what you could do instead is talk about a preprint, write that conversation up, share it with the authors and the public. And then you're getting recognition for reviewing activities. And the authors are generally very appreciative of, of this because you're doing it at a point where they still can improve their work and change things in response to peer review. The other thing that I, I think is really important to talk about here is that all these initiatives are growing. So we've currently got over 35 different platforms on which to review a preprint. They range everything from quite free form expressions. So these are social media posts or comments through to things you would very much see as a journal peer review. Elife are the obvious ones here, but things like Review Commons uh, or Peer Community In, they're on that, that journal-like side of things. Review Commons, if you're not familiar, basically what you do is you have your preprint, you submit it to Review Commons, they do the peer review, and then you have your preprint peer review package, and you can take that to a journal that they've teamed up with, so PLOS is one example. And then the PLOS editor will, based on the reviews that you've already got, will decide whether or not to accept or reject your work. So you don't have to go through another round of peer review when you submit to journals. You now just got this one thing you can take with you, which when you think about peer review is kind of how it should have been done from the start. And I've highlighted these ones as, you know, don't underestimate social media posts, comments on preprint servers. The reason I've highlighted pre-review is if you're wanting training in preprint reviewing, or if you want to do this on a more community basis, they are a really, really good one to do that with. 
Prelight are the other really good one I like to highlight because they are not a preprint review service, they're preprint highlighting. So this is more where you pick a preprint you really like and you just write a, a post about it um, and you get to interact with the authors. And it's a really good, easy way into preprinting and, and starting to review preprints. And when you do review preprints, it's good to stick to these fast principles that we developed uh, a little while ago. So stay focused, stay appropriate, specific feedback. So make it useful. Don't really comment on grammar. It's not very helpful. Um, it's very much about what is supported by the data. So do those conclusions match what the data says and be transparent. So you don't have to sign your reviews, but I, I always encourage it. I do when I, I do peer review. You know, acknowledge any oversight you may make or any limitations you have as a peer reviewer and credit anybody who writes that review with you. And again, we've got we've got some other resources. So I've, I've shared those. We also have a guide on how to do a preprint peer review that you can download. Um, you can print this off. You can use it online. Uh, we've got an actual checkbox list of criteria to go through uh, and some other stuff in there. So these are useful things if if you go away and download them and read them. So here's the, the next part of the talk, talking about the quality of preprints. So there's this huge misconception that preprints are preliminary work or that they are in some way poor quality. Now I've put quality in quotation marks because it's kind of hard to really define quality in terms of science. What do we mean by quality? Is that reproducible? Is that done to a high standard? Is it impact? Is it good? There's a lot of things tied up in that word. I'm going to kind of take them all when I do this, the rest of this talk. But this is very much a misconception. This is not true. And how do we know that? Well, people like me have gone away and, and looked at this. So about 70% of preprints are eventually published. This is some earlier work. Um, and there are, there are, I think, three, two, two or three different papers here. This is data from two or three different sources. Showing them, this is by archive data on the top here. Uh, actually, I think all of this is by archive data. But basically, what you're seeing is very steadily around 70% plus of preprints are eventually published. Um, differs a little bit across fields. But this really does hold true. Um, you, the, the, the decrease here is just due to when the data collection occurred. So if 70% of preprints are eventually published, that suggests at least that they're not poor quality to begin with, otherwise they would never be published. Not that the 30% that are not published are poor quality. I can't remember if I have a slide on that or not. And I said I had done some of this work, so this is data I was part of this, this uh, team. What we did is we looked at the preprints that were published about COVID and also the non-COVID ones around the same time. And we did a huge number of different manual comparisons Painful work to do. I don't recommend doing it, but it was a very interesting thing to do. And we got some interesting data out of it. So what we did was we went through and counted the total number of panels and tables in a preprint and its published version. It's the same article, but it's undergone peer review. And you can see whether it was COVID or not COVID, the total number of panels and tables didn't actually change on average. Um, and what, it would be messy if I linked all of these dots up, but the, you know, the dot at the top is the dot at the top it really didn't for the most part change we also looked at the percentage of articles when we were doing this and what we did was when there was a change we know what that change was so was it just that figures had been rearranged so nothing had been added was it that significant content had been added or maybe removed or both added and removed and what you see here is over 60 percent had no real change about 15 percent had figures that were rearranged, but nothing new had been added or removed. And about 20% of the literature that we looked at had significant content either added or removed or both. So in our case, about 80, 85% of what we looked at did not change in any meaningful way. And this is just in the figure uh, arrangements, but we also looked at the abstracts, so the abstracts are really important because that's the one bit of paper everyone can read, whether it's paywalled or not. And we compared the preprint to the published version. And again, there wasn't much change. So 94% of non-COVID research that we looked at in this period between the preprint and the published version 
did not significantly change. So the, the wording might have changed to maybe be a bit stronger or softer, but it was a minor, very, very minor change. The key conclusions did not change. And so if they're not changing, what is peer review doing? And this is something, again, other people have also looked at. So this reporting score, hard to define what that is. Basically, this is reporting of things like the methods, um, how the data is presented, how it's analyzed, are the statistical tests mentioned, if it's a biological model used, are the details included in that, that kind of stuff. So basically, the things you would need to reproduce the data. And between the preprint and the peer-reviewed version, you can see the scoring did improve when an article was peer-reviewed, uh, peer but very little. And again, another study looking at abstract and main body texts in this case also show that between the preprint and the published version, there is very, very little change. They are incredibly similar. And clinical preprints are probably the one that maybe matter the most because these are things that have direct um, impact on patients. But the thing is, there's been a whole bunch of studies done and they show everything that I've just shown you already. There's not a big change. Most things don't change. And when they do change, things like the confidence intervals are slightly smaller. So basically what peer review is doing is it's making us slightly more confident in the data that is presented. But for the vast majority of articles, it is not changing the key conclusions, or in many cases, the data. I can see when we did this, because we did it manually, we were reading everything. Uh, we had, I think it was two to 400 pairs of articles to read. We did it twice because we thought we could do it better the second time. We had a slightly better uh, method. And literally, in some cases, it was identical. The preprint in the paper, there were no changes. It was word for word identical. So 70%, roughly, are eventually published. About 70, well, over 70% have limited or no changes in their figures. Over 85% have limited or no changes in their key conclusions. Preprints and published versions have similar scores in terms of reporting. The abstract and main text remain similar upon publication. Over 80% of clinical preprints match their published versions for endpoints and interpretations. And there's data for all of that. So what is peer review doing? And what does the future need to look like? So what I, th I really think we need is a layer of trust indicators and signals that sits on top of a preprint foundation. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. So you post your preprint, and that is the publishing part. You've published your work, it's out in the open. And this then allows community-based feedback. This could be peer review, transparent peer review. Whether that is organized by a journal or one of these independent preprint review services, doesn't matter. But that's one of the things. It could be publishing in a journal that is a badge of reproducibility and reliability, depending on what that journal is doing. We could have badging services. So is your data available? Is your data usable and transparent? Have you shared methods and materials? All those kind of transparency indicators. We could have context-based information on your citations. So in your article, have you just cited a load of retracted papers? Because then your paper is probably not very reliable unless you're doing a study on retractions. Or over time, how are people citing your work? Are they citing it positively? Or are they all saying this is very problematic and there's something wrong with it? And these are all community-based feedback systems. And this is what I call the integrity and trust layer. So I call this the PIT model, publish integrity and trust. I think it's really important to separate out integrity and trust because these do all those different things. And so you end up with a system where you have a preprint and it's got all these things attached to it to tell you whether or not you can rely on that preprint. And we could do a very similar thing with authors as well. Individual researchers could have assessments based on their integrity and their transparency. Importantly, this is something that really should be scholar led. There's a big space for journals. I was just at a conference talking to journalists, um, journals, and there is room for that. But the reason this needs to be scholar led is because that's how we need to be judging each other. We don't need to be doing it based on 
some metrics that are owned by the publishing industry. We should be doing it by based on the people we want to work with and the people we, what, what we think in our field is, is trustworthy indicators. Cause this will not be the same for every field. I'm talking about life sciences, very focused here, but in the humanities, they might use different trust signals. They might not want the same ones we use and that's okay. It should be scholar led and relevant to the field in question. There is a whole bunch of extra articles you can go away and read here. And I just want to point you to some other resources we have. This is our schedule for 2024. It is available here. It's a live document. So all these links for the ones that have happened already are now links to the recordings. Um, and there's, there's some I've highlighted here that I think are particularly relevant to this. I've already given you the history of peer review link further up in this talk. Um, but we've also got things about scientific publishing and, and where that sort of actually comes from. Um, and I, I suggest you go on and have a look at those. The next session will be how to post a preprint and how to choose a preprint server. That'll be happening in two weeks.